welcome everybody to the live edition of the Weekly Space. I guess they're all live. The in person, the human version of the Weekly Space. You're made of matter. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Look at this. <laughs> so, um, right. So we're in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, at the Science Online 13 conference, 2013, and we've got us and about 450 of our best uh, science communication friends, besties, besties, and uh, and so we brought some of them here and some people you're going to recognize, of course. So we've got start on my right. We've got Nicole Gallucci. Hello. We've got Amy Shira Title. Hi. And we've got Alan Bullitt. LLP, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so we actually have been very busy here, and so we've been a little disconnected from the news. So we brought in some ringers. So we've got Scott Lewis. Hey, everybody. There he is. And we've got Thad Zabo. Hello. So this week, um, we're going to be talking a little bit about what we're doing at the, at the Science Hall. Science Online con conference, um, and I got to do a big talk this morning, which is freaky, but uh, we'll go into that in a bit. Um, and then we're going to be talking a lot about the anniversary of the Columbia disaster, Challenger disaster, and the Apollo 1 disaster. So um, that's been a lot on our minds here. And then I know we've got a story about, and what was it, Scott? Some uh, some stuff on the sun. Yes. Yeah, with um, it was with the flux ropes from the right. Solar Dynamics Observatory. Hi, yeah. Camilla. Camilla's here. <laughs> yeah, I Camilla is here. here. Yeah, I, and I, I told her earlier on Facebook that, Nicole, you are my surrogate for hugs, so you have to give her a hug. So I gave her a hug and she squeaked. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and lastly, we're going to be talking about uh, a storm on Saturn that's been, uh, that looks like it's eating itself. So it we'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so, uh, well, I think the, the I, so the big major story, and this is the one that I know, Alan, you've been working on it. Like today, we haven't seen very much of you because you've been uh, what? You wrote one article, you edited uh, three. I, I wish I could say I was, you know, right there on the scene at the Cape for the memorial of the yeah. uh, Columbia tragedy. It was ten years ago today that the Columbia shuttle fell out of the sky over Texas, and so there has been a series of uh, commemorations of that, uh, including uh, the uh, ceremony at the Space Mirror uh, Memorial at uh, Kennedy Space Center, and so we've been watching that, we've been talking about uh, what uh, NASA has drawn as lessons from this, uh, where are we going next, uh, really the Columbia accident and it's not actually an accident, as one of our stories points out, that it was a disaster that could have been totally preventable. Uh, the Columbia disaster uh, really led to the situation where we are now with the shuttle fleet retired and uh, a lot of uncertainty still about where we're going uh, in the space effort. And so there was a lot of reflection on that today. Uh, Bill Gerstenmeier, who is the Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations, uh, acknowledged that uh, this problem should have been caught at the very beginning of the shuttle program in 1981, that they always knew that ice and foam was falling off the fuel tank and hitting the shuttle, and they didn't do anything about it because nothing super bad was happening until 2003, February 1st, when a piece of flying foam uh, breached the leading edge of the left wing of the Columbia, and that set the stage for, uh, for the... Um, that hole to create aerodynamic problems. It allowed the hot gases of atmospheric uh, reentry to get into the shuttle uh, and basically uh, caused the shuttle to break apart and killed all seven astronauts. So there was a lot of talk about uh, the legacy of these, these astronauts. It was really a rare mission in that it was a purely science mission. It didn't go to the uh, International Space Station. Instead, they did something like 80 uh, experiments uh, and so uh, the the legacy is in those experiments, but also just in the um, in the international nature of the mission, and and uh, really in NASA's uh, willingness to press on. Kirsten Meyer did say that ten years ago it would have been easy to just withdraw from the space effort, uh, but uh, they had tried to fix the broken culture that surrounded the uh, Columbia 
uh, disaster and uh, move on. And uh, there's still some question about exactly where NASA is moving on to, yeah. uh, whether it's the moon uh, or asteroid or Mars. Uh, President Obama issued a statement uh, memorializing the, the Columbia astronauts today and said that uh, their sacrifice will help uh, will help uh, get things going for eventual missions to Mars. And so that was kind of the theme of the day, is that uh, one of these days on the red planet and uh, yeah. the sacrifice of, of Columbia and the hopefully the improvements that led from that will will help clear the way for those and, big missions. And so what was the sort of the stories that you were working on today with your, with your team? Well, um, Jim Oberg is uh, right, one of, of our one of our uh, uh, analysts here, and so his, one of his stories was the ten uh, most commonly uh, held myths about uh, about the Columbia uh, disaster. And, uh, and for example, there are all sorts of uh, myths about uh, space lightning hitting the shuttle, and that's why it fell, or uh, or uh, you know, uh, a Tesla death ray uh, being at fault, or uh, one that has come up just in the last As few... As opposed to the Tesla death rays that work? Uh, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but one that yeah. has come up in just the last few days is this idea that, uh, oh, if NASA knew about this, they weren't going to tell the crew. And yeah. as a matter of fact, uh, that was reported by several media outlets as, as uh, saying, oh, NASA knew about the shuttle problem, but they didn't tell the crew about it. And uh, yeah. this came from a blog post that Wayne Hale, a uh, former shuttle manager, had, had made. And uh, really, Wayne was talking in theoretical terms. What would happen if right. there was something right. detected? And uh, you, you think about that, that famous speech that Nixon had, yes. right, for, mm -hmm. the, for the astronauts that were on the moon. And, you know, what speech would he give if if they turned out that they weren't going to be able to get the astronauts back home? And, you know, and what would he say? And it was actually quite a poignant it's a very sad speech. So do you wonder, you know, would they give a similar speech to the astronauts if, mm -hmm. if that was happening? So, um, I think that there was, uh, they discussed the situation with the Columbia crew at the time. They didn't, you know, they could have followed up on some of the information that they had uh, about this uh, foam loss at launch. And that was one of the flaws that was pointed out is that they should have done more investigation yeah. of that. And they probably would have discussed that with the crew. I find it hard to believe that they would have kept that information from the crew. So, yeah, uh, yeah. I think it was something that was under discussion what the scenarios were. But in the end, I'm yeah. sure that the crew would have been involved. And I'm, I mean, a lot of the, I mean, you can remember the, the months and years after when they did actually get the shuttles launching again, they had to develop this entirely new, sophisticated camera system with this extended boom arm that they, they put on the end of the arm and they would they would run it down the bottom of the right. shuttle and examine the shuttle in, in tremendous detail. And they just didn't have that and they weren't performing those kinds of procedures. So there's no way that they would have known what was what was going on. And you know, it was when they actually took those kinds of precautions, they could actually start to see this damage that actually was happening on the shuttle. It was quite. I can remember even with some after, some launches afterwards when they when they did find some some little holes and chunks and pieces of foam that were falling off, and they were having to discuss, you know, are we going to, you know, what are we going to do about this? You know, are we going to send out the patch kit? Right. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, do you guys so, yeah. remember where you? Do you guys remember where you were? And it was a very memorable event yeah. when that happened. And I know that there's very few things in modern times where we know exactly where we were. And I would say that this would be, would definitely be one of them. Um, where were you guys at and what was going through your mind as it was happening? Well, so I was, uh, I'm trying to think. So when the Columbia accident happened, I was in Vancouver. And I, it was a Sunday morning, wasn't it? No, Saturday morning. It was morning. a Saturday morning. Saturday yeah, morning. I remember it was a weekend morning. And I came down, and, and because we're on the West Coast, um, I guess we it was a little later for for us. It was like eight, and I'm trying to think when I found out it was like eight in the morning for me, and I turned on the television and every channel was just was that, and I just like dropped everything and started the reporting. So mm -hmm. yeah, I was asleep when it happened. So uh, I just had there were other people at the office. I figured oh it's a science mission, it's kind of a routine mission, it's a Saturday. It's been a long week. I, I'll just let them take care of it. And then I got the call. They woke me up and, and said, uh, 
the shuttle hasn't come back. And, and, you know, when it doesn't come back on time, you know that something bad has happened. So I, I just got into work and it took me a little while to get revved up, but I was there. I think I was there for a 20 hour day. Oh, yeah. 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 It's crazy. Yeah. What about you? What about you, Amy? Um, I mean, this is before I was doing stuff online and really into this. And um, I just remember getting up on Saturday at some point. I can't remember what time of day it was, but seeing it on the news and just kind of watching it. And yeah, I wasn't engaged with the stuff yet, but yeah, I remember watching it most of the day. Yeah, I was in my college dorm room and my mother called and I thought she was calling me because it's my brother's birthday. And I said, yes, yes, I'm going to call. I'm going to call. You know, you don't have to remind me. And she said, no, put on the TV. And please, please, please don't ever go into space because I still really wanted to be an astronaut then. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So that's how I found out. And then I, I was also watching the coverage all day. Um, yeah. yeah. So what about you, Scott? I was working, actually. This was back when I was a firefighter. Mm. And so I was, I was on the job. And I, I didn't hear about it until the radio was turned on. So we were, I, was, I was working, going on and back and forth. And I remember just uh, hearing it over the air. Um, where someone was mentioning on the, on our radio inside our in our ambulance, and so when we went back to base, we turned on the news to take a look what was going on. It was really crazy. Yeah, and, and Dad. So again, I was on the West Coast, so I was asleep when it happened, but I still remember, and it was the same initial reaction as with Challenger, just total disbelief that how could this happen? And I mean, okay, you watch the footage, and then it starts to sink in, but it was just you know. I was uh, I read the the first bit about it online and it was just like this no this couldn't have this couldn't have and then you you read a few more and you you look yeah. at more of the details and, and then it starts to sink in so yeah but that that initial just no not again right not no so yeah I mean I I really felt like with when Challenger happened. NASA really sort of took these hard lessons and went back and then the the message the consistent message coming back was it's safer now we 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 had some problems some oversight issues and we fixed them and and it's safer now and and it was that second accident that really as you said, sort of made the decision like that's it. Mm -hmm. We can't trust these machines anymore. This is a test vehicle. Yeah. Um, the test is about over. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think, and that's, you know, and that's not something that necessarily they had really told the public. They hadn't told the public that, that, that this was a very dangerous and risky vehicle, as you say, a test vehicle. And, and, and they had sort of said, like, it's like a truck, it's right. like a space truck, you know, and it's reliable and it goes to space and it delivers this stuff. But really, every right. flight was a, was a very, very risky flight. And the astronauts sure knew it. I mean, they... You know, I talked to a couple of astronauts, and I'd ask them, like, was it, you know, was it fun to ride launch? And uh, I talked to Story Musgrave about that, and he said, no, no, I did not enjoy the launch. Wow. I found it, it's a, it's a very, it's a very wild and rocky and, you know, very jarring experience, and you're really aware of, of how dangerous mm -hmm. this machine is and how much fuel you're on top of. And, and you really are holding your breath and just hoping everything goes right until you reach orbit. And when you get to orbit, then everything settles down and you can really then relax and kind of enjoy the experience. But the launch itself is, you know, and I, I liken that to almost, you know, turbulence. When you're coming through turbulence before you come to your landing, you just want this over with. But you did come in here. Right. Which I did come in here, yeah. yeah. I, I, well, I think yeah, the that uh, people would probably wonder, well, if it was so dangerous, why did they continue to fly it for eight more years? And it was so that they could complete the International Space Station. There were some pieces that just could not be brought up any other way. And yeah. so in order to fulfill their obligations, they decided to, to uh, minimize the risk as much as they could and then fly out the space station construction missions and then yeah. put the shuttles in museums. And I think, though, right, that at that point then they really... You know, we now understood the risks that these astronauts were taking. I think they had known all along, but now we, the public, really, really appreciated it. So now, as we said at the, at the beginning, this was a bit more of an anniversary as well, which is, and they always come together every year. It's like 
the Challenger. It's Columbia and it's Apollo, the Apollo One Apollo disaster. Apollo One fire. Yeah. So um, the anniversary was I don't know what date it is right now, um, but the twenty seventh of January is the forty sixth, I believe. Oh, I usually have a calculator in front of me. Yeah, 40, um, 46. 46th anniversary of the Apollo 1 fire. So um, the, the issue with that one was um, this is a pre-launch test. It was called the Plugs Out Test, and it's just a basic test of the spacecraft system on, running on batteries. And it's a, a full launch simulation countdown um, Everything just as it is for launch, cabin pressurized, full spacesuits, uh, mission control, everything running, except the rocket does not have any fuel. So because it was an unfueled rocket, in this case it was a Saturn 1B, um, it was never classified as hazardous. And somehow, uh, well, through arcing wires that no one is totally sure how they became exposed, um, wires sparked, started a fire, and in a 16.7 uh, pounds per square inch pure oxygen environment of the capsule, it just fireball exploded, and I think it took the crew, it was less than a minute that they succumbed to, um, they were asphyxiated before they were actually burned, but um, oh. the, um, I mean, it was it was nasty, and you hear, you, you well, I don't think I've actually heard the real recordings of it. I think I've just heard actors doing it because I don't know if you can get the real recordings. Um, but it's just this garbled transmission of fire and burning and we got to get out and um, when they opened it up finally, I think it was almost an hour after the fire started, um, Ed White, who is the uh, lunar module pilot, I think, on that flight, sorry I'm really tired today, um, <laughs> was turned around, was in his seat, turned around um, reaching for the, the door because the procedure called for the, um, he's in the center couch, so he would have been the one to open the door, he gets out and then the commander, Gus Grissom, would have got out and Roger Chaffee was sitting in his seat waiting because he would have been the last one to leave. Um, and the, the post-flight investigation turned up just hordes of problems with Apollo and the whole controversy of pure oxygen environment and fires, which was not unknown to NASA. I mean, there had been a Soviet Death, um, a cosmonaut, Valentin Bondarenko, had died in a training accident in, in an oxygen fire. And there had been Army and Air Force and Navy tests on, like, what does pure oxygen environment do to bunnies? Well, let's go in with some bunnies and find out. And there was a fire, and they died. Yeah. All these things. I mean, wow. this, was, this was not unknown, but a two-gas system is really heavy, which is a problem on Apollo, or was, and um, complicated. So they opted for the oxygen because it was simple, and um, that really came back to, to haunt them. So it was, I think, 18 months until they, they totally redesigned it, and the Apollo Block 2 is what emerged. And they did have an, an oxygen-nitrogen mix during launch so that if there was a fire, it wouldn't get into that massive fireball situation. It would stay relatively manageable, and it a new hatch with a quick opening with explosive bolts so they could get out and um, never had another fire on Apollo so it was a lesson learned but it was the first major setback that NASA ever experienced and it was really called into question the whole why are we doing this why are we risking lives and it was, and, yeah and it was really public too like a, a lot of the Soviet disasters weren't yeah. as public weren't yeah they didn't. as in front of the world <laughs> as that one was. definitely not I mean this was a, I mean NASA was so open that people were there waiting for the test to happen this was I think launch date was February 21st so they were less than a month away from launch so this is very public and they had three very public funerals um, 30 30th and 31st of January um, I mean NASA was hugely attacked um, I mean weird weird things emerged like that that the crew had been murdered um, I've been getting into a little bit of this and um, should have had the article done by now but I didn't get it done before I came here um, I mean allegations that that Grissom had had a hissy fit one day and thrown his helmet into the capsule and actually broke the wire that sparked that he'd kicked it um, a lot of people blamed him for the fire and which outraged a lot more people yeah um, can you imagine if there was if there was an internet back then and oh, oh my god yeah yeah um, and then and then in in 99 Gus Grissom's eldest son Scott came forward and alleged that um, there was the, uh, the capsule had actually been sabotaged because they wanted his father to die so he couldn't be the first person on the moon. Um, so this, I don't, I've seen sort of a little bit of rumblings of this, but I've never really seen a good, solid, investigative, journalistic piece on, on what it was. But he said there was a panel behind a toggle switch that was designed to short out when they, when they tripped it. And I don't, I don't know, but it's, um, it just keeps coming up. This is sort of the big one that everyone yeah. sort of... 
the first major right. event. So the, the things are going to get crazy in here in, in about 10 minutes, right? We have oh, five. Yes. The sessions are ending. Are sessions they ending pretty soon? Yeah. It's okay, so let's let's quickly go then. Um, I want to talk a bit about Science Online. Just the quick part is I gave a presentation, one of the, I guess, the... The converge, the converge sessions. sessions, yeah. So there's sort of two big talks every day, and I got a chance to do one. And I presented the Virtual Star Party and the Weekly Space Hangout and all of the stuff we've been doing on Google+. Plus. And, and so I think uh, a lot of the people here are now all running around signing up Google Plus accounts. So Yeah. So people I, were really impressed. Um, if you look at the tw Twitter stream, it's hashtag SciO13, which I put at the bottom of yeah. our lower third. Um, you can see the discussions going on around all of these sessions and, and the uh, the emotional response to that virtual star party video. Yeah, there were, still I was following huge. the hashtag and people kept saying, oh, I'm tearing up watching <laughs> yeah. this. Oh, I yeah. need to be a part of this. Yeah. So it's, yeah. um, it's pretty oh, interesting. And and this happened at 9 Eastern, which was yeah. 6 Pacific, and my <laughs> stuff was blowing so up. <laughs> you Twitter. Oh, really? This, so this is my friend. day of sleeping in, typically. No, it didn't happen this did, morning. Didn't I say you were going to mention you, Scott? <laughs> no, you did. Really? I just didn't, yeah. you didn't tell but me started, what time and when. So. I knew you're the one that brought him up on Twitter. I, yeah. I told everybody, hey, you want to get your telescopes in? Talk to Scott. Yeah. 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 Sorry, Scott. Yeah. It's okay. I, I still love you. <laughs> but hopefully we get a bunch of new telescopes in that. Yes, be great. I've so, already. Yeah. I already got uh, get a lot more three people. Plus. Yeah. Um, well, actually, and now I, my whole lunch meeting was teaching people how to use Google Plus, and now Pamela and I have they've done a an impromptu session that Pamela and I are going to be presenting how to get on Google Plus. So, yeah. Um, so then let's quickly go through. So Scott, you you had this picture from the sun you wanted to show people. Yeah. So. Yesterday, there was a story, let me pull it up real quick, it's from the NASA Solar Dynamics Observatory, or a little SDO, as they like to call it, and it's, it's going over um, heliophysics, so actually going over the physics of the sun and what goes on with, uh, when we're talking about coronal mass ejections, and um, what's something called flex ropes. So, flex ropes are... Is it's plasma that is going along the magnetic lines of the sun, but we've always been able to see them either, you know, knowing that they're there when a coronal mass ejection happens, or we don't know if it happens beforehand or if it's concurrent, where they they just work together. Well, last year um, in July 18th, they saw a, a big flash from SDO on the limb of the sun. So it was right on the edge. It was perfect for actually being able to see it. And then eight hours later, they saw not only the, the ionized plasma going over here, they started seeing the, the flex ropes form as a coronal mass ejection happened. So to add a little bit of history on here is that in 1925, was when we first discovered that there was that the sun had a magnetic field. We didn't know that at the time. You know, we had up at the Mount Wilson Observatory. We, there's a solar tel or excuse me, a solar tower there to observe the sun, and it was George Ellery Hale and Seth Nicholson, which discovered the fact that the the polarity and the magnetic um, fields actually switch every 11 years, so it has a 22 year cycle. So going forward with that, we are trying to figure out more and more about the sun and trying to figure out why it's doing this the way it is. But up until this release yesterday, we didn't know if these flux ropes happened beforehand or if they happened concurrently. We saw that it did form first. The plasma went up into the magnetic field, and then it, then it snapped, and that's what released the coronal mass ejection, sending that ionized plasma out into space. So it was really, really cool. Um, a beautiful image, too. Um, I have it up on my website, and it's also on the Solar Dynamics Observatory's website as well with NASA. But it's it's really cool that we're still learning stuff about our star, you know, our sun, the closest thing to us, and that allows us to understand these stars that are further out in space. Once we have a reference point with our star, we can start learning more about the other ones that are out there. So, <clears throat> yeah, it's... um. Pretty incredible seeing the the dynamics of this. That you you have this incredibly complex system. That it's not simply plasma. It's not simply um, the weather essentially on the sun. But there's a combination of you get flows of charged particles. Those induce magnetic fields. Magnetic fields affect the 
trajectories of other charged particles. And so trying to, to solve the equations for this is, is incredibly complex. I mean, I remember seeing this at a, a seminar on helioseismology that I went to at, uh, at NCAR, um, the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Um, in in Boulder back in 2006, that okay, here's the last day of all these these talks and classes you're going to. Now we haven't really shown you the math of what's behind this, and it, totally intertangled and very difficult um, differential equations, totally interdependent differential equations to solve. So, um, so yeah, trying to model this, trying to come up with a, a good idea of the the exact phenomena behind it. Um, there's there's a reason that discovering it observationally was probably going to happen first because we've only in the past decade been able to model what happens in general relativity as, as black holes or neutron stars start to combine. This is an even more complex mathematical problem than that. So um, so finally having some good solid observational data ahead of time is, uh, is a big plus here. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and share another image that's up on the SDO website. And it, it's showing at the different wavelengths of light that you're able to see it at. And so it's extremely bright. It's extremely hot. And the one here in the green is actually in the uh, was the the extreme um, ultraviolet. So it's so hot that it's emitting this light in, in the ultraviolet wa wavelength. And this is where we start getting into x-ray photons and stuff like that, that even though the surface of the sun is 5,800 Kelvin, that's not hot enough to emit light at these high frequencies. But um, but as you're getting hotter and hotter and hotter, when we start seeing things happening in the corona, so we start seeing these coronal mass ejections, that's when things are getting extremely hot and that plasma is being released out. And yeah, like you're saying, that just the, the geometry and the mass involved with what's going on with these mag with the magnetism is insane. It's absolutely crazy. And this is something I always point out with um, to my students when we go over the sun is, you know, okay, here's a picture in visible light of what the sun looks like today. And for a while there, from 2007 to 2009, that was a very boring picture. <laughs> There's just no sunspots. Right. There's really not much of anything. But then you bring up the picture in the ultraviolet um, that's usually also available on spaceweather.com, and you can kind of compare. You have them side by side. And... Um, even though there's nothing going on in the visible light picture, there is all of this higher energy activity uh, in the form of maybe f filaments or these magnetic loops, and it's not strong enough to cool an area of the sun and cause a sunspot, but it's still there, and it's still possible to track the rotation of the sun and track this extra activity, even if it's not strong enough to actually form a sunspot. So being able to look at the sun in these shorter wavelengths, and I can't quite remember what the color variation is that they use or the, the color choices they use for the extreme ultraviolet there. I think the blue might be um, 191 angstroms, uh, or sorry, no, 100, 191 uh, nanometers, 1910 angstroms. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, so you're looking at something that's about twice as energetic to, about twice as energetic as the, the, the most energetic light the human eye can detect. Right. So, no, the the one the one in the middle of the teal there is one thirty one angstrom, and that's around ten million Kelvin. So, well, I'm not sure. No, let's well, if we're if we're going off of Wien's law, um, that's that's much cooler than ten million Kelvin, but still much hotter than the average surface of the sun. Right. So, okay, okay, um, and I guess the one other that we wanted to mention here was that new information coming out about this storm that was on Saturn. So beginning in, um, <clears throat> let's see, it was December 5th of 2010 when this was first detected um, by the Cassini spacecraft orbiting Saturn and also by amateur astronomers. This thunderstorm developed that when it reached its maximum size, it was 7,500 kilometers across. To give a, a comparison for that, the radius of the Earth is only uh, 6,400 kilometers, right? So this is bigger than the radius of the Earth, is this thunderstorm. And so as it's moving through Saturn's atmosphere, it's dragging a wake behind it. So you have all this turbulence that's going behind it. And we got to see this develop over several months. But eventually the head of the storm moved around the planet far enough that it caught the tail of this wake that it left behind. And in doing so, it died out very rapidly. 
And so this is something new. We've never seen this happen in the solar system before. In all of Jupiter's storms and all the times we've seen storms on Saturn, we've never seen the, the case where the disturbance in the atmosphere it has such a strong remnant and the motion of the head of the storm comes around and catches the tail. So this is the whole Ouroboros idea, right? The snake that's eating its own tail. Um, so we have this come up on Saturn and it appears to have wiped out the energy of the storm. So it was a lot of lightning, a lot of very turbulent activity. We It finally makes it around the planet, kind of catches its own tail. I guess it's that June. So more than 200 days later, and at that point, the, the energy dies out. Very different dynamics from what we see, for instance, on Earth, where if you have a hurricane and it comes over colder waters or it comes, comes over land, it can die out. Um, but on Saturn, there's no land. It's hydrogen and helium, and it gets denser and denser and denser as you move toward the middle. Eventually, you have a transition where it's not behaving like a gas so much anymore as, as it is a liquid, but there's no solid surface. There's nothing under there that would indicate that there should be like some extreme temperature difference. So um, so we don't know how long the storm could have gone. The, the longest storm ever recorded on Saturn, um, I think, was on the order of about 280 or 300 days, but it was a much, much smaller um storm than this one. It was about 100 times smaller in area than um, the one that was seen here. And I know the this large storm that we saw consume itself essentially was, um, I, I had gotten photographs of it and it was a great target for amateur astronomers for all of the beginning of, of 2011. Uh, being able to see because Saturn, you know, the rings are spectacular, but the atmosphere itself is usually pretty bland. When you're looking at Saturn, it's right. like let's let's see what's going on in the rings. So now we had something really exciting for the beginning of 2011 to actually photograph in in Saturn's atmosphere. So awesome! But it well, ate itself. I, I think I I think uh, Nicole and Fraser and Alan are being kicked out soon by an epic dance party. <laughs> From what I'm hearing, oh, but we already got style. kicked out. Kingdom style, yeah. That's why we're in yeah. the loud room, and, and it, the sessions are letting out, so yeah. we have to get going. Yeah, so this room is going to get a lot louder. But I want to show you guys uh, just a taste of what's happening at Science Online. Uh, oh, are you going to do? Are you going to start dancing? No. Talk. No. Oh, oh, oh. Can everyone see that? So this is this is the main area where everyone kind of meets in between the there sessions. You go. So you can see there's uh, there's about 450 people here and uh, and a lot of uh, pretty great uh, people who you probably would recognize from all your science reporting <laughs> and our audience, the audience. All right, the audience. Cool. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for uh, and thanks to Cole for making this happen, no matter what. Um, I think, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, <I'm glad>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and thanks to Alan for joining me. And sorry, Amy had to go. Um, oh yes, Amy had to run for a meeting, but she says thank you, everyone. Yeah, yeah, and thank you very much, Nicole, again for putting this on. Thank you for Scott and Dad for showing up, and and sorry you weren't here. Uh, yeah. Maybe we'll see you. Uh, you're here next year. Uh, thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. All right, everyone. Our next show is going to be on Sunday. We're having the oh, virtual yeah, star party. I will be hosting as Fraser will be en route back to yeah. Vancouver. So we will still be doing our, our typical time on February 3rd, and we will see you then. Okay, okay. So that's 6, 6.30 Pacific, right? Yes. Okay. Right. Come say hello. Come say hello to the Internet. <laughs>